Heavenly Father, we aren't ready. It is easier for us to hide in the upper rooms of our lives, to let the world go by and not acknowledge your presence. But you have challenged us to come alive again with your love of, and words of healing mercy. Forgive our hesitant witness and our complacent spirits. Heal our fears and our wounds. Help us to be agents of, of healing and hope for others. Challenge and inspire us to overcome our feelings of, of inadequacy and remind us that you have called us beloved and have given us what we need to proclaim your good news. Please help us to open our, hear, open our ears, open our hearts, open our minds, and open our lives to your words. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. So today's, today's scripture, today's scripture is John 1, 9 through 13. John 1, 9 through 13. And this is a, uh, it's a very long series that we are in. And so I split it up into three different parts, three different parts of 10 weeks. And uh, after the end of the first 10 weeks, we're going to have a rededication, reaffirmation service for our relationship with God. Um, and the first 10 weeks is about how to think like Christ is. So if you could, follow along with me. John 1, 9 through 13. The life light was the real thing. Every person entering life he brings into light. He was in the world. The world was there through him. And yet the world did not even notice. He came to his own people, but they did not want him. But whoever did want him, whoever did want him, whoever actually believed he was who he claimed and would do what he said, he made to be their true selves, their child of God's selves. These are the God begotten, not blood begotten, not flesh begotten, not sex begotten. Let's read that again. To those who did want him, who did believe he was who he claimed to be and would do what he said. To those who basically confessed with their lips and believed with their hearts, he made to be their true selves, their child of God selves. So is today's scripture. Amen. Amen, amen. So the secret thing that... Um, so that if you look at the bulletin cover... The title of the sermon is um, The Christian in the Iron Mask. And you all remember from grade school probably the, the Man in the Iron Mask, and it was also a movie. And um, so I, I, was, I was thinking about what the message was going to be about this week. And all week long, I kept hemming and hawing about the land of the lost came to mind, and the, the Man in the Iron Mask came to mind. And I was listening to some corn and some um, Alice in Chains, and the Man in the Box came to mind. And it all sort of fitting, but I couldn't actually say the man in the box because if you listen to the lyrics of Alice in Chains, it's not exactly what I should be saying in the pulpit, um, although I probably have a couple times. But the Christian and the Iron Mask, it fits because we're talking about our identity this week, our identity in Christ. And if you go to the, if you go to, um, in the bulletin here, the very last page, everybody flip to the last page of your bulletin. So it says on the last page, Discipleship Growth Sermon Series. I think that's the last page. Um, we are examining what it means to be disciples of Jesus Christ, to think, to act, and to be like Christ. So the first part is we are in week five of this, is we're identifying our core beliefs of Christianity. God, personal God, uh, salvation, the Bible, and our identity in Christ. And so over the next five weeks, we're going to be concentrating on learning what it is to think like Jesus Christ. And as, you, as we go along, I hope everybody starts to piece together how each consecutive, how each consecutive, 
how each consecutive week builds upon the previous chapters. Can you say consecutive? We believe, for example, we believe there is one true God, the God of the Bible, the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit. We believe that he is personal and involved in our daily lives. We believe that a relationship with God is only possible by grace through faith in his Son, Jesus Christ. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation breathed by God. I know there are some people in church, there are some people that claim to be Christians that they will like to pick and choose like they're in a buffet about what to believe out of the Bible. There are even some in the United Methodist denomination who would like to just pick and choose what they like to believe out of the Bible. And I hate to tell them this. You can't pick and choose and say one part of the Bible is true, but another's not. We believe that the Bible is God's revelation and has the right to command by beliefs and by actions. And through the word of God, we discover this truth that is very important. It is the idea that our true identity is in Jesus Christ. One of the most important indicators of your happiness and your quality of life is going to come from your actual belief in that statement. Because most people find their identity and value in things that don't, that don't last. So I had all these name tag labels printed up to have everybody wear while they were here. And it had stuff like Pharisees and um, heretic and... Um, judgmental and my anxiety, like, hi, my name is my anxiety. Hi, my name is, I'm judgmental. Hi, I'm a Pharisee. And my teenagers at Calvary stole all of my um, labels. Apparently, they like to go around telling people they're judgmental. I don't know. But our identity, it's, it's a strange thing. Because do you actually believe that you are significant because of your position as a child of God? Not do you say it, not do you think it, but do you actually believe it? How many people have wondered in their lives, who am I? Do I fit in? Do I fit it? What do people think of me? Am I good enough? By the way, my name tag label said, I am drama. No comments, please. What do people think of me? Am I good enough, smart enough, attractive enough? Am I thin enough? Am I young enough? Am I too old? Am I this? Am I that? Our identity is an odd thing. We want, to, we want to own our identity, to be our own person, autonomous. Yet our identities are immensely, immensely intertwined with people and other outside influences. Our identities can be crushed or cultivated, influenced by good for good or by evil for evil. They can be abandoned, disguised, corrupted, or they can be nurtured and rediscovered. Much like the man in the iron mask, the Christian in the iron mask goes through life with this mask on, disguising and hiding who their true identity is. Too, too often, our true identity is buried underneath our sin, our mistakes, our mistreatments, our failures, and our false perceptions. Many of us hide our true identities with facades and masks. I can imagine somebody who their goal was to tear apart a church, to tear apart the house of God, or to tear apart some person. We dare not let the real us become exposed. Many of us hide our true identities. Interestingly, humanity was, was created in nakedness. You know, even though we try to spend our entire lives covering up something, we are created in nakedness. Covering up, covering up, putting that iron mask on every single day to hide our identities. That's not how we were designed. I think God spends a lot of time trying to uncover what we try to hide. God is interested in a genuine relationship, genuine fellowship, not a Facebook acquaintance, not an Instagram acquaintance, not somebody you see post on Twitter every once in a while, not somebody you wave to from across the aisle at Walmart as you make a mental note of what ridiculous items they're buying. It's hard to be genuine when we build walls 
we put on masks and we have facades because God is interested in the truth. If we allow God to get to the truth of who we are and who we should be, that is freedom. And unveiling our true identity has much to do with reaching our potential and our position in Christ. But until then, until we can actually be true and unveil our true identity, we flounder. Our desire here at this church, our desire here at Holy Cross, in case you're wondering, is to help other people reach their full potential in Christ. Our goal at Holy Cross is to help others reach their full potential in Jesus Christ. So in essence, we want to help each other uncover their true identities in Christ. And so we're going to uncover our true identities in Christ. And it's interesting because, you know, that's a biblical mandate to build each other up. In a biblical worldview, who's one father is matters. It's a great importance. That's why we often so, we so often read in the Bible, so-and-so is the son or daughter of so-and-so. Yeah, I remember when I was, I was 13, 12 or 13, and I was visiting my, my aunt and uncle in Tennessee, mom and dad's hometown, basically. And I was walking from their house over to the um, school. Their town is so small. Kindergarten through high school was the same building. And um, what a beautiful town. But I remember walking through town, and there was this Grizzly Adams-looking dude. You know, imagine Frank with a big, long beard and, and a, a shirt, you know, a sleeveless shirt, and he's sitting there, and he's got dip stains on his shirt. And, and so this guy comes out of his front porch. He's looking at me, and he goes, you're Bucky's boy, ain't you? And I go, oh, Lord, what did Dad do now? <laughs> and my first thought is, I don't care how much I don't run. I can outrun this guy. But the idea is, I might be addressed as Brent, son of Tom, son of Tommy, grandson of Tommy, Bucky's boy. But it's a biblical worldview, not just some archaic practice, our identification with a father. Get it with a father or family line or family line. Remember, family line is critical. And we don't have the importance to, no, the time to discuss the importance of earthly fathers. But understand that spiritually, a biblical worldview offers only two family lines to be identified with. Two family lines. Don't laugh too much because this makes total sense to me. I didn't realize this until the 930 service. I never thought of this before. There are only two family lines to be identified with. The Adams family, it totally fits. Or God's family. Those are the only two lines that there are. And we've talked extensively about it, but in brief, all are born into this, this Adam's family. We're all born into this massive family of dysfunction and death separated from God. So all those episodes, everybody go home and watch Adam's family, because I know I'm going to now. Therefore, our identities, they're just whacked out. We don't think right, we don't behave right, we don't believe right. But God. But God sent his son into this chaotic Adam's family and through his death and resurrection offered salvation and adoption. Key word, offered salvation and adoption into his family. You are not automatically a child of God. You are not automatic. He offers it to everyone. That doesn't mean everyone accepts it. So here's how you accept it. To all who believe and receive this gift of salvation, to all who confess with their lips and believe in their hearts, have faith in Jesus Christ, to all who receive the gift of salvation, receive the promise of new life, freedom from sin and restoration of their true identity, to all who believe. See, the thing is, it's not about just saying, I believe. It's not about just showing up in a building and going, I believe. It's not about going out and doing good deeds and being a nice person and helping other people and, and being all, all smiles and, and sunshine and, and all that stuff. But you have to actually believe. That's why our beliefs are so important. 
to all who believe and receive the gift of salvation, receive the promise of a new life, freedom from sin, and restoration of their true identity to all those who receive with their hearts, with their lives, with their beliefs. God gives the right to become children of God. So when anyone says to you, especially the devil because he's really good at this, who do you think you are? Who in here has had somebody in the last 18 months come up to you and go, who do you think you are? It can't just be me. That's why I had that drama name tag. What gives you the right to do X, Y, Z? John 1.12 does. If you have authentically received Christ, you have the authority. So my identity becomes or comes from my position as a child of God, not from my performance as a child of God, because it's not about your acts. It's about your faith, you, what you believe in. So my identity comes from my position as a child of God. And if we look briefly back at, or if we look briefly at Luke 19 and see how it plays out in real life, and I'm going to need some help with a name coming up because, you know, everybody to me in the Bible is Bubba. I want us to remember what, I, what, what was said earlier. Our true identity is discovered by knowing who we are through the eyes of our Creator. And just imagine how much that is going to change the way you live when you start looking at each other, not as, oh, you've got drama, oh, you've got this, oh, you've got that. But once you start seeing each other through the eyes of our Creator, you'll see it, you'll grasp it, and there's this, there's this wee little man. And somebody help me out here. Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus. Bubba. Zacchaeus. Um, no doubt his identity was wrapped up in his occupation. It's, it's the message translation. Um, no doubt wrapped up in his occupation and social acceptance or lack thereof. Because you see, he was a tax collector. Tax collectors were Jewish agents employed by the Roman Empire to extract taxes from their fellow Jews. It took a really heartless person to make a living by cheating and stealing from the very people of your community. It's like children who steal from family. Because of that, he was socially unwanted. Tax collectors were the scum of society. They were traitors. They were hated. They were unpopular. They were unwelcome. They were cut off and ostracized and disowned from the Jewish society which is a huge deal back in that time. To top it off, he was more than just an average tax collector. He was the regional director of tax collectors. This guy wasn't just scum. He was super scum. He was on Jericho's most wanted list, or most unwanted list, rather. But he heard that Jesus was passing through, and for whatever reason, he wanted to go see Jesus. But he had a problem. And everybody knows the story. But what was the problem? The problem wasn't that he was too short, because that's the first thing I thought, I thought of too. It's not that he was too short. The problem was the crowd. The crowd could have said, I make way for the wee little man and let him see Jesus. But no, they didn't budge one bit because they didn't like his identity. If you read through the Gospels, you'll notice something about the crowds that follow Jesus. And there are a lot of crowds that follow Jesus. They gave the appearance. They gave the appearance of following without really following. Imagine that. Imagine people following Christ, pretending to follow Christ. Imagine people in a church even that are not there because they want to follow Christ. Imagine that. Does that ever happen? Nah. They didn't budge one bit. The appearance of following without really following. And everybody in Facebook land is going, not me. And the kids outside are going, not it, not it. It may have felt good to be in the Jesus crowd or to be in the crowd, then be that little clique where you got to go to church and you got to socialize. You got to feel important because you had a position at the building. But in reality, they were the greatest obstacles 
to those who wanted access to Jesus, the crowds, the mobs. They crowded around Jesus, taking up valuable space, mumbling and grumbling and blocking people from seeing Christ. Yes, you can have people that will try to block your access to Christ. But we're not here to talk about crowds. But we need to consider something. Not everybody wants to see Jesus like Zacchaeus. Zacchaeus? Zacchaeus? We got to change his name. How come there are no Bobs, Barts, and Bartholomews in this book? My gosh. I don't know of many Bobs in, in like Middle East, though. But for those that do, am I like a crowd blocking the view to Christ? Am I sitting here obscuring somebody else's access because all I'm thinking about, all I'm consumed with is my identity, my life, that I am, that I am so consumed with the label that I place on people, that I place on myself, that I'm just standing in the crowd. Oh, I can see Jesus, but too bad for those that can't. That might just be next week's message. I don't know. When Jesus reached the spots, when you're looking for Jesus, he will meet you where you are at. If we think back to the man that was at the pool named Bethesda, this man has been there and he's trying to get to the pool. He can't get to the pool. So Jesus walks up to him because even though the man could not get to the water, the living water came to the man to ask him, do you want to be healed? He'll meet you where you are even when you can't get to him. So Jesus looked up and he saw this little man in the tree. Jesus called him by name. He didn't call him tax collector. He didn't call him shorty. He didn't call him wee little man. Not you heartless, good for nothing, no good, lying, cheating, scumbag, SOB. No, he didn't call him that. But notice the crowd's reaction. He was nameless to the crowd, identified by his behavior, by his failure, and by his sin. Even though Jesus called him by name to the, to the crowd, he still bore to the crowd, to the people, to those supposedly following Jesus, he still bore a scarlet letter upon his chest. To the people that were supposedly following Jesus, he was still his anxiety. He was still what he did. He was still the good for nothing. He was still this. He was still that. And I wonder how many people in our world get up each, uh, get up each day hoping that scarlet letter would disappear. How many people have become nameless because their identity is covered by a label that we put on them or that somebody else puts on them or that they put or that we put on ourselves? Do you know, I checked on this, I did some research, and I found out this to be true. Every homeless person has a name. Every prostitute has a name. Every drug dealer has a name. Every drug addict has a name. Every person with a drinking problem has a name. Every person with a gambling problem has a name. Believe it or not, every Republican and every Democrat, they both have names. They all have names. Every vaxxer and unvaxxer and non-vaxxer, they all have names. They all have a name and a true identity that for many is covered up. And it will remain covered up until they meet Jesus. Many don't know the weight of living under that iron mask of a false identity until they meet Jesus. Let's go back to a middle school literature class, Nathaniel Hawthorne. She had not known the weight until she felt the freedom, the scarlet letter. And I imagine like Hester and Nathaniel Hawthorne's the scarlet letter, Zacchaeus, sure did not know how heavy he was until he felt the freedom of a Savior calling him by name. But it was more than just calling him by name. He was cut off from his people, ostracized from his Jewish brothers and sisters, cut off from the promise and lineage of Abraham. But if you notice, it was all reinstated 
by Jesus Christ. It is the kindness of the Lord that leads us to repentance. Zacchaeus took action. And I don't want to get into judging too much because my label says drama, it doesn't say judging. But we can know a fruit or a tree by its fruit. People who discover the new identity in Christ, guess what happens? They make changes. They live differently. So when somebody comes up to me and tells me about something that somebody's doing that is against Christ or that is not the most Christian thing, that tells me a lot about their roots. That tells me a lot about their walk with Christ. That tells me a lot about their fruit. Because people who discover their new identity in Christ make changes. They live differently. And if we go back to what I mentioned at the start of this, and hopefully I don't have to go back to my notes, the start of this, we are here to help people grow and mature in their Christ-likeness. But you need to know and believe your true identity is in Christ. Whatever happens that is not good in your life, you name it, doesn't matter what it is, maybe you're in it right now, you have to know that you are his. You are a king's child, the Lord of life, the God of all creation, the Lord of the heavenly armies. He loves you. He saw every single thing you would ever do. He saw every single sin, and he still went to the cross because he loves you. He redeemed you. He adopted you. He sealed you. You are his. All you have to do is confess with your lips and believe in your heart. That, my friend, is your true primary identity. You are a child of the Most High God, Jesus Christ, once you confess and believe. And that is very freeing. I don't have to earn my way in. I don't have to give a certain amount of money to get my way in. I don't have to do so many good deeds to get my way in. I don't have to do X, Y, Z. I don't have to whatever, because it's not up to my performance that gets me in, as long as I confess and believe. It's up to my proximity as being a child of God. I don't have to struggle, and I know that when life is a struggle, I don't have to buy junk to satisfy me. I don't have to get on Amazon and buy three extra laundry hampers. (sighs) True story. I I found the secret to getting caught up with laundry. You buy extra laundry hampers. That way you don't have dirty laundry around the laundry machine. You just have it in laundry hampers. Guilty. When I remember that I'm loved, I serve differently. When I remember that I'm loved, I love differently. When I remember who I am, I give and I live differently. When I find myself in one of those moments when I'm buying something I don't need, laundry hampers, and I think, what am I doing? Why do I do what I do? What about me? What about me? What about me? What about me? Chances are... I've forgotten who I am. When I find myself leaving a conversation and thinking, was it really necessary to rip into that person and bring them down? Was it really necessary to take them to the center of town and proverbially stone them for not being like me, for not dressing like me, for not thinking like me, for not acting like me, for not believing like me? Was it necessary for me to devalue that person? Chances are, if you do, you've forgotten who you are. When I find my blood pressure rising over something that is really, really stupid, and we all do that, thinking, you don't understand me, but why don't you agree with me if you could only just see my point of view? I'm better than you because blah, 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 blah. Chances are you've forgotten who you really are. And when you remember who you are, when you settle this identity thing, When you remember it, you're free to give grace because you've received grace. You're free to give love because you've received love. You're free to serve in a whole new way because God has served you and lavished mercy on you. 
when you remember who you are, you actually live differently. And that's the thing. How does this change the way you live? Well, just imagine. Our identity is no longer tethered to this world because this world is temporary. It's not a godly world. It's corrupt. And the God of this age has blinded the minds of unbelievers. Even those Pharisees and unbelievers who have parked their backsides in a church for most, if not all, of their lives. Just because you show up does not mean you're saved. But it can mean you can clear off the podium in a hurry. Because a lot of people have not thought about what they actually believe. And if you have a hard time living your beliefs, they are not actually your beliefs. And we need to think about. That doesn't mean we're not going to have problems and we're not going to have mistakes and we're not going to have setbacks. But that does, rem- that does mean that we actually believe that we are a child of God once we, once we actually confess and believe in our hearts We know that we're going to make mistakes. He knows we're going to make mistakes. But then we confess. Then we repent. And repent was very interesting because two stories about something happened this week. So I was talking to a couple people and asked one person, and we were talking about faith, and and I asked this individual, I said, do you still sin? This individual told me, no. Really? Really? I wish you could tell me the secret to your success because I'm sinning right now because I'm cussing you out underneath my breath. I wasn't really, but... The other one was an individual was telling me and they want to start a new, a new ministry. And I, I'm, I'm really supportive of this ministry that they want to start. Number one, it, it involves youth, and, and I love kids. So, but he said he just learned at 33... He just learned what it means, what the word repent means. It means to have a change of mind. It means to repent, to have a change of mind. Our identity should no longer be tethered to this world. The world is temporary. It's not godly. So why would I, as a child of God, continue to receive my identity from this fallen world? I'll tell you why. Too many have not died yet. Too many have not died yet. Hidden, buried, covered, tucked away. Let my identity come from Christ. But that only comes from dying. Your identity from Christ only comes from dying. There should be a time in a Christian's life when they die. When they die to the old way of living, old way of thinking old way of doing things. They die to their past sins, past failures, past wounds. They can rip those labels off because they don't care what somebody says about them because their value is not dependent upon their opinion. Their value comes from the opinion of someone who actually knows them and has claimed them as their child. All you have to do is confess with your lips and believe in your heart. All you have to do is have actual faith in Jesus Christ. We are to be crucified with Christ. And the life we live, we are to live by faith in the Son of God who loved us and gave his life for us. But too many people, too many people in this church and other churches and church in general, too many people around us haven't died yet. They're still hanging on to the past. What do you believe? Amen. If you could, please, bow your heads and close your eyes. Heavenly Father, your Holy Spirit brings us healing, comfort, and hope. Help us to become more prepared to serve you in some mighty ways. Help us to rejoice because your Holy Spirit is with us always. Amen. Please rise.